Hello, uh, and welcome to my session on population health and bereavement. Uh, my name is Tony Miles. I'm a professor of epidemiology at the University of Georgia. Um, and I am delighted to be a part of this uh, bereavement summit. Um, so I want to give thanks to um, the folks at Live Evermore. Um, to introduce myself a little bit before I start talking, um, I am a professor, uh, like I said, of Epidemiology University of Georgia, um, a physician and a scientist trained in internal medicine. Uh, and you can see all the other trainings that I've done in, at the National Institute on Aging and service as a health and aging policy fellow on the Senate Finance Committee. Um, I'm a fellow in the Gerontological Society of America um, and a member of the uh, Public Health <coughs> Honor Society, uh, founding member of the Athens Area Grief Coalition, uh, and currently a member of the Georgia Medical Directors Association, which is a state chapter of the Society for Palliative and Acute Care Medicine. Uh, I do teach lots of courses and this research um, dovetails nicely with my areas of teaching, uh, chronic disease epidemiology, um, physiology of aging at the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I also teach a gender and healthcare policy session at the University of Texas LBJ School of Public Policy. Uh, I have more than 170 publications and I've mentored many, many, many PhDs, doctorates in public health, MPHs and medical students. And I have a book on healthcare that analyzes the Affordable Care Act uh, entitled Healthcare Reform and Disparities, History, Hype, Hope, which was published in uh, 2012. All right, for those of you who are interested in reading more about the work I'm gonna present to you today on population health and bereavement, uh, here's a list of our publications on this topic. We have about four or five more that are out under review, so stay tuned for more details. Um, of course, if, you're, if you wanna talk to me, there's my email address there. I also have a Twitter feed and on LinkedIn, I have a blog called Public Health in an Aging Society. Um, just want to acknowledge the many, many, many people who have been involved in this project because no one works alone. Uh, you can see all of their names. Some of them are graduate students, some of them are colleagues. They're distributed universities across the United States uh, and, and the world. And where would we all be without our funders? So I want to give a special thanks to the Georgia Department of Community Health, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, the Retirement Research Foundation, uh, the Association for Clinical Pastoral Care, and of course, the Athens Area Foundation Wellbeing Project. Okay, so what, um, what is population health and how, how am I gonna have you think about this today? Um, population health can be thought of in three general ways. You can talk about the vitality of a population, you can talk about its fertility, you, and certainly everyone is familiar with longevity. So those are the metrics I'm going to apply to measuring the effect of bereavement on population health. Uh, what kind of measurements am I gonna show you? I'm gonna talk about healthy life expectancy, talk about birth, pregnancy, uh, I'm gonna talk about life expectancy and mortality rates. So there are many, many ways to, to capture bereavement, but you have to ask about it. Um, so how do we define a threat to population health? basically something that is so pervasive and so common that anyone can and probably will experience it um, and that it can be broadly negative, uh, has a broadly negative impact on the measures that we've talked about before. And just so that we're all on the same page, the def definition of bereavement for our conversation today is the loss of someone or something very dear. And here's an Here's an image I want you to, if you can't get all of that, understand simply a threat to population health is like rain. When it rains, everyone gets wet, some more, some less. And you can see the gentleman in the white t-shirt has no umbrella, so he's gonna get soaked. 
Now, bereavement, I'm going to propose to you, is a threat to population health. It has gone largely unrecognized and unknowledged. Uh, so back in um, 2014, the group that I work with has started to publish scientific papers and analyses that measure the, the effect of bereavement on these population health metrics. So we've looked at the effect of bereavement, that is reporting that someone you love, uh, spouse, uh, parents, siblings, or children have died. It has a negative but measurable effect on the overall population's life expectancy. It also affects healthy life expectancy. It can measurably influence healthcare utilization at the population level, and it is a risk factor for insomnia. Um, we've uh, made those observations initially in a US sample of persons aged 50 to 84 years. Um, it's called the Health and Retirement Survey, and it's been around since, the survey itself has been around since 92. Uh, we use the um, 2010 survey to do these observations. Uh, and so basically what it boils down to is that in this cohort of nationally representative adults over the age of 50, you can see declines in life expectancy by about three years when a person, when for the group that reports loss compared to a group that has no loss in those categories. Um, not only do they die sooner, but people in this age group who report the loss of a, a parent, spouse, uh, siblings, or adult children will see earlier onset of, of illness. So their healthy life expectancy declines by almost a comparable amount. They are two times more likely to report having stayed in a hospital overnight, and their doctor visits increase um, measurably. The average for the group that has um, experienced bereavement is about 20 visits in a two year span. And they are 50% more likely to report insomnia. So all of those things can be measured in a population level way. And they're all public health outcomes that we've been working on. We have just never as a, as a profession thought about bereavement as being something that is, is driving this. Okay, so um, is bereavement a threat to population health? So what about young adults and children? The data set that I just talked about is limited to people 50 and older. We don't have national data sets for the measurement of exposure, that is an epidemiologic term, to uh, bereavement. So we can't measure it right now in the US. There are uh, places in Sweden uh, Nick Rostella uh, has measured the effect of bereavement on the health of children as young as five, age five, and there is a lar even larger impact on their risk for dying. Um, so one, one of the things you'll hear me talk about is the need for a national data set that measures its impact on young adults and children. Uh, but today, what I want to show you is a new data source that has that I've just become aware of, that's or just received, that um, I've had about 30 days. I'm very excited about it. This was something when we started this work back in 2014. I realized that we did not have uh, this age group, and so uh, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, or BRFIS for short is a state level survey that's conducted by all 50 states. Each state has the flexibility to add a few items. Before the pandemic was even a thought, one state decided to test four separate bereavement questions. And now we have data for adults who are 18 years and older um, at the state level, but we still do not have data for children. So I'm going to share with you some of the uh, observations we are now be, being able to make with that data set. So in Georgia, bereavement is a threat to the health of young adults as well. 
half of all the newly bereaved persons in Georgia between 2018 to 2019 uh, are between the ages of 18 to 49 years. Um, overall, that amounts to 2. Point, no, yeah, 2.1 million persons who have either lost a parent, spouse, sibling, <coughs> or child during that two-year window. That represents 45% of Georgians aged 18 and older. That number is much larger than any of us ever imagined it would be. Um, and, but we believe that it is correct and we've had um, conversations with other uh, survey designers. Um, so ha about half of that 2 million newly bereaved people are men, the other half are slightly more women. But as you can see here, there are 340,000 adults aged 18 to 29 who are newly bereaved, um, almost 700,000 who are 30 to 49, another 420,000 who are 50 to 59, and 650,000 who are age 60 and older. Uh, one of my colleagues who's a geriatrician had somehow come to think that bereavement was only a problem for older adults. Clearly, it is not. And it is the needs of the group that's 18 to 59 that we, or 30, yeah, 59, that we have yet to come to grips with. These are the people in the workforce. These are the people, as I like to say, hold up the sky for all of us. So, <clears throat> we um, have begun to look at vitality measures. And vitality, um, as we've defined before, uh, what you want to get at is something that is happening in the same window after, after the bereavement. So using this state level survey and this group of 2 million people out of a larger population of 8 million, we're already starting to see that people who experience a bereavement have a 30% greater likelihood of reporting impairment in memory or confusion, increasing confusion. Um, they are 40% they are more likely to report that out of the past 30 days, 14 of those days were um, experienced with not good mental health. That increase goes up to 60% when you're asking about not good days of physical health. So impaired memory um, or increased confusion, poor mental health, poor physical health are all manifestations in the earliest stages of a bereavement bereavement process. Um, people who are newly bereaved in the, this cross-sectional survey have a 50% greater likelihood of being obese. Um, and so all of these, these first four items um, create um, a threat to population health um, and are things that can be addressed if we specifically look for bereavement and start to address it. Now, one of the other things we found in the data is that uh, <clears throat> women 18 to 44 who report bereavement are two times more likely to report that they're pregnant. Um, haven't figured out what that means yet, but it suggests that not all the bereavement um, exposure uh, data it can be negative. But that bears more exploration because in Georgia, we have the number one, we are the number one state for maternal mortality. So bereavement reigns on everyone. This is sort of uh, what I'd like you to take away. Some get more soaked than others. We have major gaps in our policy to provide bereavement support. <clears throat> and our research, we have research, which I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, shows that supported training can increase resilience to these negative health effects. We can cut some of those risk factors in half. Uh, bereavement is an occupational hazard for healthcare workers, first responders, and public safety personnel. 
Uh, our research though shows that you can train um, healthcare workers to maintain quality work while reducing their risk of bereavement related injury and enhance their um, retention. It, uh, this is particularly um, important for nursing home workers, but we need data to measure the population effect, especially for children under the age of 18, which we have no window into, <clears throat> and especially for deaths occurring outside of the healthcare system. So here's an example of the training that we've already we're fielding in Georgia for healthcare uh, workers in nursing homes. Um, it's called best practices in bereavement care. And one of the best practices that we advocate is that words matter. So we've learned that uh, bereavement injury can be diminished uh, when you have a protocol to notify family about a death. Um, and when you're mindful of how others learn <clears throat> of the death, because um, there have been episodes where someone out of the sequence like uh, local media or um, younger members especially love to post these things on social media and wives and husbands who need to know first find out in a way that that just begins a, an injury a bereavement related injury so the bottom line we've learned from uh, 60 hours of interviews with workforce long-term care workforce, is that injury reduction begins with kindness. I'm going to let this uh, person tell you. It's just to be kind. You know, I, I, I don't think that Mr. Rogers had it wrong. <laughs> you know, number one, be kind. Number two, be kind. Number three, just be kind. And the, the world itself is such a scary and aggressive place sometimes. We forget that everyone has their own issues and everyone has their own weight. And if we can just stop for a second and just be kind or show kindness or show compassion, it, it can help somebody else, even if it's just for the next two or three minutes. You know? So this ends my session on uh, <clears throat> bereavement as a public a threat to public health, uh, population health. And I want to thank you all for watching. And my uh, email and other contact information uh, are on the first couple of slides. So I'd love to hear from all of you.